Grace to you and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. My name is PJ Tobian and I bring you greetings on behalf of the 141 saints of Bethany Baptist Church here in Bellflower, Southeast Los Angeles. Our church family has been praying for you pastors and for your churches and for the book of Colossians to captivate our souls and our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And we trust that God will answer these prayers for his glory. So because man must not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God, please take your Bible and open it to the book of Colossians chapter two. We continue our series on Colossians chapter two. Let me read to you from God's word, verses eight through 23. I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible, which should not be too different from your own English translation. Hear the word of God. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You are also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh. In the circumcision of Christ, when you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And when you were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us and has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are shadows of what was to come. The substance belongs to Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with a growth from God. If you died with Christ to the elements of the world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. This is the word of the Lord. May the word of Christ dwell richly among us. Father in heaven, we pray now that your name would be honored as holy as we meditate on your word. We pray that your kingdom would come, your sinner-saving, curse-reversing reign would come, and your revealed will would be done here in this moment, in our lives and in our churches and in our pastoral ministries, just as it is done in heaven. Captivate us with the glory of Christ from this text. Speak a timely, powerful word, a specific word for specific pastors, for each pastor, for each future pastor, and for their churches, for their neighbors, for their witness, and for the future generations who will believe, and for the, for the nations and for our convention and all the other networks who hear and will hear these words from uh, this series on Colossians and even this message now. Lord Jesus, apart from you, we can do nothing. So come help us now, please. We will waste our time if you don't come and help us. So help us, make your grace overflow to us. We want to humble ourselves before you and tremble at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. In the movie Inception, Maul, Cobb's wife, and Cobb is the main character, is convinced that she was in a dream and needed to wake herself up to go back to her life of joy and happiness. Now in the movie, the way you wake yourself up from a dream is by dying in the dream to wake up. Now, spoiler alert if you haven't seen the movie Inception. The problem was she was actually already awake and not sleeping. But that false idea that she believed that she was actually sleeping when she was already awake, it caused her to make choices leading to her tragic and unnecessary death. 
when a false idea captivates your mind as true, when it captivates your heart as true, the consequences can be deadly. There are all kinds of bad ideas out there on the internet, in our churches, on the news, in our neighborhoods. Most of those ideas are not attractive to us as pastors and to our members, but some of them do sound reasonable and some of them are captivating. These are the ones that threaten our souls, our ministries, and our churches, and our witness. Can pastors go astray? Yes, absolutely, they do. This is discouraging. I, 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 like many of you, I read the 288-page sexual abuse task force report, and I told, I, was, I, was, I told an interviewer that I was, she said, what was your reaction? I said, I was scared for my own soul that I can be captivated by sexually immoral sin and even assault. It was scary reading that. I see the sin in my own life. I know the temptations in my own mind that no one else knows. And if those captivate my heart and mind, I can be led astray and the consequences would be deadly. What if I'm convinced of a bad idea and it captivates me and shifts me away from the hope of the gospel and I don't even know what's happening? Actually, that's how it always happens. We don't know what's happening. Brothers, pastor brothers, I have good news for you this morning. God gave us Colossians 2, 8 through 23 to equip us and strengthen us to continue in Christ and avoid being captivated by attractive, bad ideas, dangerous ideas. Now, let me give you the context of the book. The Colossians here, and I'm dealing actually with the Colossian heresy. I'm not gonna go too deep into the details here, but the Colossians, the saints in Colossae were, were being tempted by these outside ideas, but it comes from actually a good desire. Their desire was that they wanted to live a truly full and fulfilled life in Christ. Who here wants to live a truly full and fulfilled life in Christ? Raise your hand. We do, right? That's a good, a good desire, no, no harm there. But in valuing fulfillment, they were vulnerable to false ideas on how to live and experience that full life in Christ. How to experience the fulfilled life in Christ. So Paul extols the glories of Christ in Colossians 1, 15 through 23. He, he talks about his own sacrifice, that he pours out his own life to make Christ known. And then he finally gets, did you guys notice this? We're going through Colossians. Did you notice that he finally gets to his very first command all the way in 2, 6? It's not until Colossians 2, 6 that he finally gets to the first imperative. And our brother uh, Marcus just preached it. Continue to walk in Christ with rootedness edification, stability, and gratitude. Now in our passage, so let me just set up the rest of the book. In, the, in my passage, and I got the biggest passage here, I think, out of all the guys, it's the negative, here is what you need to avoid in your life. Don't do this, Colossians 2, 8 through 23. And then Colossians 3, 1 to Colossians 4, 6 is this is how you set your mind on things above, and this is how you walk in Christ positively. Okay, so the following sermons this afternoon is on the positive pursuit of continuing in Christ. But I have the task here of talking about what we avoid to make sure we don't get derailed and shift away from the hope of the gospel. And so let's look at the main command here. Again, I think the main command of the whole, of the whole book is 2.6, continue in Christ, to walk in Christ. But the main command here for my passage is verse eight. So look at verse eight with me here. Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition on the elements of the world rather than Christ. So here's the main goal of this sermon. And for expository preaching, the, main, the words and goal of the text in, in canonical context controls the word and goal of the sermon for the people that are hearing it. So what's the main goal here for this sermon? The main goal is this, discern and deny non-Christ judgments. That's the main point, the main goal. God is calling you from this text to discern and deny non-Christ judgments so that you continue living your fullness in Christ Jesus. And there's two steps to get there. The first step is in verses eight through 15, and then 16 to the end of the chapter. So the first step to get there is, um, in two, eight through 15, is escape captivating ideas not based on Christ. So that's point one. Escape captivating ideas, escape captivating ideas not based on Christ. Why do we need to be careful that no one kidnaps us and takes us captive? to these non-Christ ideas, these ideas based on human tradition and philosophies and the elements of the world. Why? Paul gives us really one reason and then he expands on it. 
Verses nine and 10 are the reason. And verse 10 is really the reason. Why do you need to not get kidnapped and why do you need to escape these captivating ideas? Because you have, look at verse 10, you have been filled by him who is the head over every ruler and authority. What happened to you, saints? You've been filled by him. God has filled you in Jesus and by Jesus. You are filled full in Christ. You are fulfilled in Christ. But why is the filling of Christ enough for us that we don't need to do other practices to really live the fulfilled life in Christ? Why is that enough? Because of verse nine. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. Did you see that? How much of the fullness of God dwells in Christ? The entire fullness of deity, God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. You can't get any fuller. So if you're filled in Christ and the entire fullness of God His nature dwells in Christ. There is no more space in you that needs filling. There is no lack to be fulfilled. The entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled in the one who is fully and truly God, made flesh, Jesus Christ. But but PJ, wouldn't I be fulfilled if if the SBC recognized me or platformed me? Or or if I had the approval of well-known and respected leaders in the SBC? Wouldn't I be fulfilled if I can get some rulers and authorities in our convention or in my tribe or in my society or in po- those in political and social power, if they would affirm me and approve me and platform me, wouldn't I then really live the fulfilled life in Christ? No, no, you won't. Why not? Because Christ Jesus, truly and fully God, look at verse 10, he is the head over every ruler and authority. And you're filled in him. You don't need anyone else. You don't need to be filled in or by anyone else, pastor brother. No one else. You are filled full in Christ. Now this fulfillment, this completing in Christ is the general reason why we must not be taken captive. But Paul goes into two specific ways we have been filled in Christ. So look at verses 11 through 15. Two specific ways we have been filled in Christ. Circumcision, verses 11 and 12, and victorious life, verses 13 and 15 through 15. So let's look at circumcision. Being filled in Christ and fulfilled in Christ means you were circumcised in Christ. Look at verse 11 with me. It says here, you were also circumcised in him with a circumcision not done by hands. So it's not a physical circumcision. It's not the cutting off of the male foreskin. It's circumcision in whom? In him, in Christ. Now, how were you circumcised in Christ? If it's not a physical circumcision, how how were you, you circumcised in Christ? Read on. By the putting off of the body of what? Of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. Now, this flesh refers to our alienated and hostile pre conversion selves. Uh, Colossians 1.21 says that it's our, we were once alienated and hostile in our minds as it's expressed in our evil actions. That old you was circumcised. That was put off and put away. In other words, when Jesus, in the circumcision of Christ, when Christ was cut off, when Christ died on the cross, you died on the cross. When Jesus was buried in the tomb, you were buried in the tomb. So the old you is dead, buried, gone. And when Christ was raised, you were also raised with him through faith. Praise God for your circumcision, the dying and the burying of your old self in your union with Christ. The old PJ is gone. The old Derek is gone. The old Omar is gone. The old Hanley is gone. Died with Christ, buried with Christ. And you also have victorious life. So not just the circumcision. Look at verses 13 through 15. You have the victorious life. And when you are dead in your trespasses, the wages of sin is what? The wages of sin is death, right? When you are dead in your trespasses and sins, and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, when you are dead, Christ made you alive, or God made you alive with him, and forgave us all our trespasses. So you have the victorious life, because when you were dead, God made you alive in Christ. So when Christ rose from the dead, You rose from the dead. But if sin causes death, how can sinners who deserve death rise from the dead and have eternal life? Well, it says here in verse 13, he made you alive with him and forgave us all our what? 
all our trespasses. He forgave all your sins, past, present, and future. He, your unintentional sins, which you have a lot of those, sins you're not aware of, we sin unintentionally, and our intentional sins, our willful sins. He forgave us all our trespasses. It says in verse 14, he erased the certificate of debt with its obligations that was against us and opposed to us, and he has taken away our debt. How? How? By nailing it to the cross. We are fully free, fully forgiven, fully fulfilled in an intimate, unbreakable union with Christ, with God in Christ, and that's unbreakable. Brothers, we have eternal life. He made us alive, and not only did he give us life, he gave us victorious life. Look at verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and disgraced them publicly, and he triumphed over them in him. God the Father triumphed over the demons in Jesus. So in Christ's death and resurrection, God has defeated sin, Satan, and death. In a crowd this size, it's possible that some of you might not be Christians. Maybe you brought your children here. If you're not a Christian, let me just say to you very explicitly, God wants you to understand the good news of his forgiveness. God can forgive you of your sins and deliver you from damnation and death. Because God created us, he's holy, he created us, we're made in his image to enjoy him, but we've rebelled against God. And the penalty for sin, the wages of sin is death. We are sinners by nature and by choice. We're now enslaved to sin. And we are damned for an eternal hell and lake of fire for our sins. But the good news is the son came. He became flesh and lived the life we should have lived, fulfilling the law. He died on the cross in our place, bearing the wrath and condemnation of God on himself for sinners like you and me. And he rose from the dead so that if you repent from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ, even now, you'll be forgiven. Trust in Jesus and turn from your sins. He's calling you now through my voice to do that. If you have questions about that, talk to other Christian friends here, and they might help you understand that gospel. Pastors, remind your people of the fullness we already possess in Christ. It is God's joy to fill us and fulfill us in Christ. And now let's move on to the second point here. If we're gonna discern and deny non-Christ judgments, that's really point two, discern and deny non-Christ judgments. So escape, the, escape um, these other captivating ideas, and then you have to, to do that, the ideas, you gotta discern and deny the judgments. And here's three types of judgments. There's two here, and then there's a third one that's not explicit. Expired biblical judgments first. Look at verses 16 and 17. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of festival or new moon or the Sabbath day. I'm calling these expired judgments because all of these are biblical commands of what, of what covenant? The old covenant, right? The Mosaic covenant, the old Israeli covenant, not the new Israeli covenant in Christ, the old covenant. So don't let anyone judge you in these ways. These are commands of God, but they are no longer binding on the new covenant people of Christ. Why not? Look at verse 17, why not? They are a what? They're a shadow of what was to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Imagine that when I'm out of town, so a bunch of us who are preaching here, we went to Southwestern, so I left LA, went to Dallas, uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, to Southwestern Seminary, and my kids are sending me videos, updates, of how they're doing, how their day was, and sending me pictures of what they're doing. So I'd be watching those late into the night before I went to sleep. Now imagine, I'm doing that, I'm treasuring my kids, I'm looking at them on my phone, and then when I get back home to LA, and they greet me, Dad, you're home. They give me a big hug. And then I start looking at my phone again because I want to see what, how they're doing. And I keep staring at the phone. And I keep playing the video over and over again. And, I keep, and then I sleep with their pictures while they're there. And they're like, Dad, play with us. I don't have time. I'm busy. I'm looking at my phone. I'm watching videos of you. That's ridiculous. That misses the point. What is the point of the pictures? To point to my children, right? To point to the relationship. And the old covenant is the inerrant word of God given to us and still has fruit for us today. But the ultimate purpose is to point to Christ who is the substance. Don't let anyone take you captive by expired old covenant, biblical and helpful, still edifying judgments that don't apply directly anymore, but go to Christ and through Christ to us. Okay, so, so discern those, but there's also extra biblical judgments. Look at verse 18. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. So here, people are saying, if you really want to live the Christian life, pray for three hours a day. Have a set, you know, fast daily, ascetic practices. Take your body under control. Be extreme with your Christian disciplines. Or get a visionary judgment. 
You know, there's some people in our church who get visions of angels, and they're right there in the heavenly temple. And if you talk to them about their Christian life, then you'll really live the fulfilled Christian life. Then you'll really have the full Christian life. Paul's saying, no. Don't let anyone take you captive by those ideas, brothers. Don't, don't let anyone condemn you with those things as if that was the key to living the full and fulfilled life. What's wrong with those rules? Four things, and it's in the rest of the passage. Four things. Number one, inflation. Look at verse 18. Let no one condemn you. Why? It says at the end, such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. It causes pride. Extra biblical rules inflate you with pride of your old Christless pre-conversion self that was diluted with self-sufficiency. Secondly, look at verse 19. He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons grows with the growth from God. So here, the problem is you would shrink. Instead of growing with the growth from God, if you hold on to these extra biblical regulations of legalism or even extra biblical um, regulations of you're free to do this and license where you're disobeying God's command, you'll shrink. You won't grow. So inflation, shrinkage. Next is burden. Unnecessary burden. Look at verse 20. If you died with Christ to the elements of the world, why do you live as if, you're still, as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle. Don't taste. Don't touch. All of these regulations refer to what is destined to what? To perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrine. They unnecessarily obligate you. God is not telling you to be burdened by them. Why are you putting yourself under them? First John 5, 3, God's commands are not burdensome. These commands are burdensome and unnecessary and destined to perish. And lastly, look at verse 23 here. Although these have a reputation for wisdom, by promoting self-made religion and humility and severe treatment of the body because they're so spiritual, they are of how much value are they in, cur in curbing self-indulgence and the flesh? They are of no value, not of any value. They are worthless. Why are they worthless? Because when you take on these extra biblical judgments and these expired biblical judgments, it makes you more dependent and reliant on yourself rather than on Jesus, and it feeds your flesh. All right, so I have a question for you. Are all rules, regulations, and laws bad? Yes or no? No. Which ones are good? Which ones are inherently good? Biblical commands, right? But here's a question. Can biblical commands ever go bad in your life? Can you ever use them wrongly? Yes. When? When can biblical, lands, biblical commands lead us astray? I want you to think about this. This gets at the heart of the passage. We, we excommunicated a member from our church just two Sundays ago for non-attendance and sexual immorality. Is that bad? Unrepentant sin after many months of pursuing the brother. Is it wrong to hold your church members accountable to attend the gathering and not to sinfully miss the gathering? Is that wrong? Is it wrong to want to be devoted to prayer, Colossians 4.2? I want to pray 20 minutes a day, and I feel like that's weak sauce in seminary. I was to, uh, um, we had a homework assignment to pray an hour a day, and I want to get back to that, Lord willing. But is it wrong to pursue unhurried prayer for 30 minutes a day? Is that wrong? Yes or no? No, it's not wrong in and of itself, right? Is it wrong to confess your sexually immoral lust to other brothers, James 5, 16, to fight sin and temptation for your joy and faithfulness in your marriage? Is that legalism? Should we get rid of these commands, yes or no? No, that, the answer can't be get rid of them. But why is it that even sometimes these biblical commands and biblically warranted practices lead us astray? Why? Two answers, two ways of getting at the one answer. Two ways to see the error. One is framework, and the other one is fittingness. Framework and fit. Look at Colossians 2.4. I am saying, look at, this is not my text, the previous text. I am saying this so that no one will deceive you with what? Look at that word, with what? Arguments that sound reasonable. Not just the command, but the argument. So this is the framework, right? The problem is not the biblical command, but the framework in which the biblical command is placed. So if I said to you, if I said to our church members, do not neglect gathering together and encouraging each other as you see the day drawing near so that you can become a Christian. Is that good or bad? Bad, right? You don't become a Christian by going to church. You, but it's a, it's a biblical command to go to church gatherings, right? But if you set it in an unbiblical argument, the whole thing is bad as an argument. But it sounds reasonable because I got Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 in my pocket. Even Satan quoted Psalm 91, 11, and 12 telling Jesus to do what at the temple? Jump off. 
Don't you believe Psalm 91, 11, and 12, Jesus? So the framework for the command can be off, even though the judgment is good. Another way of getting at it, it's not fitting. Look at Colossians 2.8. Um, at the very end, be careful that no one takes you captive through these things based on the elements of the world, rather than based on or according to whom? Christ. The, the word there is according to Christ. When I think of according, you can think of it two ways. One is, how, how tall is this iPad? Well, what tool would I need? A what? A ruler, right? And the, the ruler would set the standard, and we could measure this according to the ruler. It's the standard of measurement, right? Another way you could think of, accor of according to is I got a charger here, and if, if this was low on battery, and said, hey, can you, can you lend me your charger? If, I, if my phone was dying, and I have an iPhone, and you have an Android, and you give me your plug, that's great. It, it, it does have power, but will it work with my phone? No, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. And so sometimes we have biblical judgments that don't fit with Christ. It's the wrong outlet or the wrong plug. It's the wrong standard. They are based on and according to human traditions rather than Christ. In other words, so, so when do biblical ju judgments lead us astray? The answer is when it marginalizes Christ. When it pushes Christ out of the center and standard and puts something else, even something biblical, even the Bible itself. Put the Bible in the center over Jesus or, and marginalize Jesus or more baptisms or healthy church traits or being pro-life or prioritizing family or opposing racism. When you put those things in the center, what happens is Christ is subtly removed and marginalized from the center and all of a sudden, with the Bible, it sounds biblical. These arguments sound reasonable, but they're not. It's not according to Christ. It doesn't fit with Christ. You're subtly being taken captive by a biblical command with an unbiblical philosophy and theology that is of empty deceit and not according to Christ. It's not the command or judgment that's wrong, but the argument. So brothers, what am I telling you to do? Test everything. Is it from him? Is it in him? Is it through him? Are you walking with him? And is it for him? If it's not, it's not fitting with Christ. It's not framed in Christ. When a biblical, biblical command is not rooted in, dependent on, and moving toward Jesus Christ, then that command is not properly connected to our communion with Christ. A biblical judgment, decentering Christ, is an eccentric biblical judgment. A biblical judgment, marginalizing Christ, is an eccentric biblical judgment because it pushes Christ outside of the center. So, does your biblical judgment take you deeper into Christ, the center, or does it marginalize Christ? Brothers, sisters here, test your judgments. Don't assume it fits because your heart is sincere. Be correctable. I love the Southern Baptist Convention and I love this pastor's conference, but let's beware of being, I, and, and we need to get pumped for Christ. But when we, if, if we get too much into a pep rally type spirit, we might start cheering too quickly that we're not actually saying, wait, am I wrong? Am I, am I holding this biblical? I, 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 thought, I assume I'm biblical, but I need to pause for a second and test it. I need to check myself. I need to check myself. When you trust and renew your focus on Christ, you continually seek to obey and appropriate ideas according to Christ and fit it to Christ. And when you fit it to Christ, look at chapter two, verse 19. Look at 219 here. You hold on to the head. And what happens when you hold on to the head? I love this. This is my favorite, one of my favorite phrases in the whole passage. The very last part of verse 19. When you hold on to the head, what happens? You grow with a what? You grow with a what? A growth from? A growth from God. You'll grow. You'll grow with the growth from God. What happens to the world? Colossians 1, 6, the gospel grow, uh, bear fruit globally. Or Omar's passage from, from Colossians 1, 10, in us individually, it'll bear fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. We will grow if we hold on to Christ and we fit it with Christ and frame it in Christ. We will grow with the growth from God. And brother, that's what I want. That's what you want. I want to grow with the growth from God. I want my family to grow with the growth from God. I want my church to grow with the growth from God. I want the churches in Los Angeles to grow with the growth from God. I want the pastors of the SBC to grow with the growth from God. I want your churches to grow now in the future churches that will be planted 
and revitalized to grow with a growth from God. I want all churches that preach the gospel, Baptist or non-Baptist, non-denominational, Presbyterian, Lutheran, if they're preaching the gospel of Christ, I want all of them to grow with a growth from God so that the gospel spreads and the glory of Christ covers the, the earth like the waters cover the sea. We want to grow with the growth from God, and to do that, we have to hold on to the head who is Christ. It's growth captivated with the philosophy of Christ. So, Pastor, Pastor Brother, God will grow you. He will grow your church if you hold on to Christ. Not maybe the growth, the numerical growth you think, maybe, maybe not, but you will grow in Christ if you hold on to Christ and not the expired biblical regulations or extra biblical regulations or the actual biblical judgments made eccentric. So what are some expired ex extra or eccentric biblical regulations that you're submitting to? For me, it's effective time management. I wanna be a better manager of my time. I wanna pray more regularly. I wanna be a dad who blows my kids away where they just wanna open up their hearts to me every time I talk to them. I wanna be a fun dad who's also intentional with the gospel and, and shepherding them well. I'm having a, just struggling with different kids how to do it well. I want those things, but I could want them so bad that Christ is actually placed outside and not central and framing my parenting and my praying and my time management. And that might be for you. Be a healthy church or be an evangelistic church or pastor, grow your church. Make sure everyone's happy in your church. Impress people with your preaching or your counseling or your warmth or your humor. Speak prophetically and insightfully into the culture and to politics. Post on social media. Brothers, escape the pressures to grow your church and to impact the world as if it all depends on you. Discern and deny these extra biblical Christ marginalizing ideas. Even for the SBC, we need to, as we, as we think through and debate and deliberate and disagree, we need to take every thought captive to Christ. To be faithfully biblical, it must be framed and fitted with Christ. So let me close with this. Let me close with just summarizing the command. Here it is. Reject expired and extra biblical regulations reorient eccentric biblical regulations and connect them centrally to the preeminent Christ. Then go deeper in Christ with his words and commands. Brothers and sisters, ideas are powerful because they are captivating. Continue to be captivated by Christ so that you escape the captivity of Christ's marginalizing ideas that endanger and empty your soul, your family, your church, and your pastoral ministry. The next two chapters this afternoon are gonna be unfolding what it practically looks like to continue in Christ. But let me close with this good news. God will grow you. He will mature you. God will establish you in Christ and he will build you in the faith. God wants to grow you. He sent his son. If God is for us, who can be what? Against us. If he gave us his own son, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Hear my heart, Lord, take it and seal it for thy courts above. I love you all with the love of Christ. May grace be with you all. Let's pray. Father, may we forget what is unbiblical and untrue from what I said. Anything that's imbalanced, anything untrue, anything that does not fit with Jesus from what I said, may those things all be forgotten right now. And may, and may what is true and fitting to Christ and resting in Christ and for the glory of Christ dominate our hearts and minds. Lord, take your word and fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding to more faithfully seek Christ, love our families, shepherd our churches, love our neighbors, and cooperate to take the gospel to the unreached language groups of the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.